been thinking about our theme, brothers, do the impossible. And uh, when you hear that, you probably have a list. Maybe in your mind, it, it drops, like we have this little drop list in our computer world. I've been thinking about that theme, and you know, my list looks kind of like this, do the impossible. I thought about our, our text last night, follow me. You know, I, I'm thinking about Aaron Dudley following Jesus. And I, I would put that in the do the impossible uh, category, right? Number one commandment in the Bible, the greatest commandment, love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I would put that for Aaron Dudley in the do the impossible category. Um, please don't laugh at this next one. I don't mean this funny in any way, sincerely. Love your wives as Christ Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. If I have to look at Aaron Dudley, um, I'd have to put that in the do the impossible category. Um, you know what I mean? Be ye holy, even as he is holy. I'd have to put that in the do the impossible category. Um, I think I'm in good company. Uh, I've been hanging out with you brothers. <laughs> I think I'm in great company, and this is the point, brothers, the whole point of God making his spirit available to us is he commands the impossible, doesn't he? He speaks to us, depraved, wicked men, a tendency to love self and promote self, and he, he commands us some very impossible tasks, but remember, our Lord gives us the will and the ability to do, right? You, you know that scripture. He would never command us to do anything that he wasn't willing to give us the ability, the power, the strength to do. Um, for those of us who believe on our Lord, to them he gives the power to become the sons of God. Isn't that awesome? So I, I pray you would let that theme kind of mull around in your heart and your mind as we uh, spend the day together. <clears throat> I'd like to pray and uh, let's continue where we left off. Okay, you can turn your Bibles and your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. We're talking about the life of Peter, if you're just picking up with us. If you had to work last night, just got here this morning, welcome, glad you're here. The theme or the, the area of study that the Lord laid on my heart is, is the life of Peter. I find great comfort in the life of Peter. I, I don't in any way exalt this man. I definitely exalt the work of God in that man. And I think out of all the characters in the Bible, you know, I, I, I relate to Peter, um, and I mean by that his weaknesses, I, I relate to them. And I've found great encouragement personally um, looking over his life. Father, I know you have a plan in this room this morning. I know you see through all the facade, Lord. You have these righteous, blazing eyes, Lord. You cut through fabric and flesh and fake smiles. And you see right into the heart of every man in this room, Lord. You know exactly where we are at. You know exactly um, how close or not we are with you this morning. And Lord, I know your desire is to draw us near. I, I knew you came from heaven to earth to reconcile God with man. And Lord, if there's any of us in this room that are distant this morning, distant, uh, robbed of joy, <clears throat> There's a dryness in our life, spiritually speaking, Lord, I pray you would move in a powerful way, Lord. You'd, you'd bring us back to that place of just gratitude, so thankful for what you've done. <clears throat> Lord, speak to this group of men this morning. Um, your will be done in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the verse-by-verse -verse pastor in me struggles with just hitting highlights of Peter's life. You understand, right? I want to do this thorough exposition on all the ins and outs of Peter. There's no time for that. So I, I'm going to try to summarize Peter's life, building towards the outpouring of God's Spirit and the very obvious change in Peter's life. I want to kind of boil it down to two major things, okay? Two major things. The first thing, as I summarize the life of Peter, is Peter, the Apostle Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, was definitely a man given to extremes. That's obvious as you study his life. Some examples of that. Peter, a fisherman, with all the fears and all the, the, the myths of, of the great deep. You understand, we didn't have the ability to study under the ocean in those days. Under the Sea of Galilee, which obviously is, is fresh water. 
They didn't have the ability to take cameras and, and, and do experiments under the surface. And, and that's why when Jesus would say, for example, if anyone would cause one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better to have a millstone tied around his neck and to be cast into the depths of the sea. Scary enough, right, for us who understand you know, buoyancy and imploding and all the surface tension and all the things that would happen, but for a culture who had no idea what was below the surface of the earth. All they knew, men go down there and they don't return. Do you understand the shudder that that would have created in that fishing community? <clears throat> well, Peter grew up on the water and the storms of Galilee. If you've been to Galilee, you, you understand how through Mount Arbel, how that little funnel uh, takes place and how the wind escalates and just creates a violent storm instantly. He grew up on that lake. And all the myths of legends of monsters and creatures and you know how fishing community, the fishing community to this day is extremely superstitious. They really are. Very superstitious people. Um, you know, getting on a boat like I told you. You know, the guy that I fish with, which he's better now. He's come to Christ. Superstition has left his life, praise the Lord. But I remember getting on the board, jumping off the, the, the wharf or getting out of a skiff into the boat. He never wanted me to hit the deck of the boat with my right foot first. So I'm always like, you know, wondering how to stand because that's bad luck and we're going to go under. It's like, give, give me a break. Could never put a hatch upside down. Never carry something onto his boat. Blue. I'm thinking, homie, the whole ocean around us is blue. <laughs> you know, the sky is blue. They got all kinds of real, never bring a woman on the boat. They, <laughs> so that could be problematic, I suppose. It could be. All these superstitions. Well, that was Peter's world, you understand? So there was this occasion, you know the story there, they're rowing across Galilee, right? Our Lord Jesus observing them, praying on a mountain, observing them, probably Mount Arbel. It's the best case scenario. And as you know, way into the night, our Lord Jesus just starts to pass them by, walking on the water. And, and you know, we read that and think, that's miraculous, that's amazing. But for fishermen to see that, all of those little childhood fears, all those little childhood stories and myths just became very real. Do you understand that? And, and these fishermen were cowering in that boat, quivering, no doubt. The Bible talks about them being exceedingly fearful, except Peter. This is what I mean. This, this kind of depicts how, how this man was kind of given to extremes. You know, just to, to go beyond the norm is the definition of extreme, right? Peter says, you know, Lord, if it's you, he identified himself as the Lord. If it's you, invite me to come out there with you. <laughs> I love that. Okay, you, you know every man in that boat was like, what? Are you? And, and he did, right? He jumped over the gunwale of that boat and began to pursue and walk. Flesh took over. Fear took over. Got consumed with the storm. Took his eyes off the Lord and sink, right? Is the next result. But just, just understand the makeup of this guy. Peter couldn't handle just having his feet washed like all the other disciples, but he had to resist, he had to question, he had to wonder out loud, and then comes to the conclusion, wash my whole body then. Give me a shower. Extreme dude, truthfully. Extreme guy. The arrest takes place in the garden. You guys are familiar with the scene, right? The disciples are there. It's a cold night. We know it was a cold night because Peter ends up warming himself at the enemy's fire. And all of a sudden, this mob makes its way through the garden of Gethsemane. Torches clubs, fierce faces, temple guards, and all of these men, and we'll look at this later on in our, in our study today, all these men cower, all of these men run, but Peter draws a sword, given to extremes. You know, they say in a, in a critical stress situation, there is one of three reactions that's going to happen. There is flight, fight, or freeze, right? It's true. Peter knew nothing about freezing. He couldn't even keep his mouth closed for 10 minutes, right? He knew nothing about running. That, that was not his natural approach to anything. Peter knew about drawing a sword and going forward. That's the type of man Peter was, given to extremes. Okay? 
Tradition tells us, this is, this is not in the scriptures. I can't verify this by pointing to God's word, but I think there's sufficient evidence in tradition, right? Correspondence between Christian people in the, you know, end of the first, into the second century, that even in the death of the apostle Peter, he took a very extreme approach. You guys know the story, right? As he approached that Roman cross, he starts to shake his head. Oh no, 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 you will not execute me the way my Lord died. I am not worthy to die in the manner of my Lord. Spin me upside down. That does something to my heart. I think I understand that guy. And let me tell you something, guys. The first thing that we consider when we look at the life of Peter and his tendency to be given to extremes is, first of all, there is only one course of action for a man like that. And do you know what it is? It is ministry. It absolutely is. A man who is given to extremes, he has the makeup to to take the norm and go up here, that man will not survive. I'm convinced of it. He will not survive in this world by going to church on Sunday morning. He won't do it. But he needs a task at hand. He needs to put his hands to a plow and tow. Needs to. Personalize that. I bet in this room there are men like Peter who have the tendency to just go beyond what is expected, go beyond the norm. And unfortunately, sin twists that all up, doesn't it? And we take that, that makeup, that precious makeup that maybe God gave us, and we bring that into the very shallow party scene. Big deal. Big deal if you can outdo or drink more or snort more or win more girls. Big deal. At the end of your life, what in the world does that count for? Who's impressed? Consider this. We stand, we sang about it, we stand in the end of our life, not before our peers who will applaud the keg stand, okay? We stand before the almighty righteous judge who is wounded, you understand? Wounded for you. Take that makeup that God gave you, brothers, and serve him with all of your guts. That's main. For please. (laughs) Serve him with all of your heart, all of your strength, all of your soul. I would like to present to you with that extreme tendency, with that that makeup that just makes some of us go, you know, above and beyond what, what is expected, what is even considered responsible or normal, there is a great vulnerability. This is what God has to work out of Peter. This is what God has to work out of Aaron Dudley. Still is. There comes an extreme vulnerability if this is describing you. Okay? Vulnerability, right? Vulnerability. You know, the definition of vulnerability is the inability to withstand in a hostile environment. Unable to withstand in a hostile environment, aka life on earth. Okay? There's a vulnerability. And the reason why we are vulnerable, brothers, because if you are the fight type of guy, if you are the extreme type of guy, guess what? You have an extreme tendency, as I do, to rely on self, don't you? We, we have an extreme tendency to rely on self. That is no good in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, we are actually a detriment to our Lord in that case. Um, not just less than ideal, we're a danger to his cause. If our ministry is tainted with self and our personality and grabbing things and strongholding and forcing, the whole ministry loses the fragrance of Christ. And it becomes a a personality-driven ministry. I I heard a brother pray, and I I totally agree. You know, that that maybe we don't have a seminary graduation. Maybe we don't have a, a vast Bible knowledge, but we all have a testimony. And I say amen to that. However, be careful Be careful because you know what can happen? If our evangelism is just our testimony, we can really slip into promotion of self. Very easy. This is who I was. This is who I am today. Don't you want to be like me? Look what God can do for you. He can do this for you. Who are we truly promoting? Right? Our testimony must be like the Apostle Paul. Very generic. Very bad. This is who I used. He gave some details so that everybody got the picture. But the entirety of Paul's testimony is what Jesus Christ did in his life, who Jesus Christ is. 
Remember that, guys. Make sure your testimony gets to the point quick. Make sure it's him that we're promoting. Are you with me? An extreme tendency creates an extreme vulnerability, reliance on self. I'm going to bear my heart with you again. <clears throat> this happened a while ago. There is a drug epidemic in Machias, Maine, and, you know, me and my good friend Paul, um, we do house calls. You know, it's, it's not just a, an office church environment. You know, heroin addicts don't typically hang out at church, right? You got to leave the church and go to their homes and go to their, their little holes and, and sniff them out and, and, and embrace them. You understand. I'm sure some of you have that identical heart. Well, there was one occasion where we became aware of somebody that we've been pursuing, somebody who has done well for a season but fell. I became aware of where he was buying crack cocaine and shooting it into his arm. Became aware of the source, the dealer, and made the determination to go behind him and interrupt a sale. That might be unwise. Um, that might be vigilante, that might be um, a bad approach, and I'd probably say D at this point, all the above. But I really, at the time, and we at the time, it was love-driven, there is no question, and you know, you think that you're at a certain place with your walk, and you think that, that you know, you're hearing from the Lord, and somebody's got to push back in this community. Sometimes the law enforcement, in fact, often the law enforcement in our little community just so conveniently turns a blind eye, and it drives me crazy, truthfully. And as you approach them and plead with them and try to pass information, we have an addiction ministry. We have the goods. I could show you 12 to 15 drug dealers in my little community, but they thrive and thrive. And in the, in the, in the comment, and I get it, you don't understand, they'll say to me, the, the, the law enforcer, we are bound by policy. I am not, I say. I don't have those policies. I got the love of Christ in my heart. And I did. I walked up those apartment stairs and doom, 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 doom. A guy in there I love. I'm, I'm so tired of doing overdose funerals. And the place was just scattered. Ah, who is that guy? And it was me and my good friend Paul. And I introduced myself. Who are you? He said, I am a local pastor. That's all I said. <laughs> and the door opened. And I took the opportunity, no breaking and entering, the door opened, I went in, and I really intended to say, this needs to end, I know this guy, I know what's going on here, this ends today, no longer do you supply him, please. That's what I intended to do. It didn't go that way. It didn't go that way at all. And I was, quite honestly, brothers, humiliated for the next week after that. Just really disappointed with how I handled that situation. There were words that came out of me that have not come out of me for a long time. There was a, a, an attempt to try to intimidate that I, I really am I'm embarrassed about, quite frankly. <clears throat> and that really came to a, a peak where this one man who we've been ministering to, or not, another individual, came into our Arise program. And just last week, I'm driving around. I'm sharing Jesus. I'm trying to help him, you know, clean up some messes that he made on his run. And he said to me, this drug dealer's name, and he says, you know, he has made it very clear he would never come to that church. Man, I got to own that. I got to own that. That's a soul in there. That's a soul in there. And what he saw was a very, you know, arrogant and in your face. And, and listen, I can justify it. I, I got a page where I can, I can tell you how I, I love that guy and I really was frustrated. And, you know, I can, I can justify the whole thing because I'm used to doing that. But at the end of the day, I have to just sit in humility, right? Or humiliation and say, you know what, Lord, I misrepresented you in that apartment. I understand, Peter. I understand that the tendency to be extreme can be a huge hindrance to what God wants to do in an individual life. I'm, I'm aware of that, very aware of that. Would you process that, brothers? Would you personalize? How would the Lord speak to you with, with that character flaw in Peter? And how can the Lord use that at the same time? That's something to boil over, okay? Second thing, okay? The second thing is Peter... And if you're a note taker, I don't know, it might be worth writing down. Peter knew who, the, 
the Messiah was. Peter did not know the way of the Messiah. And big issue, big problem. As you look at the, the whole life of Peter, he would quick to identify who the Messiah was. Even say, you have the words of eternal life, right? You know that about Peter. But the thing that Peter did not understand and had to go through a process of death to discover was the way of the Messiah. You understand? His, his approach to life, his mission, um, something that was very foreign to Peter's mind. So with that, let's look at our Bibles together. Matthew chapter 16. I'm sure you're familiar with this. I'm sure you're, you've been taught this by your pastor, your Calvary Chapel after all. And in the 13th verse, Jesus came into the borders, literally. My old English says coast, but it's the borders, the town line of Caesarea Philippi. And he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay, let's, uh, let's unravel this a little bit, brothers. First of all, Caesarea Philippi, you can still go there, it's still there. That site has been for generations a very pagan environment, you know that. The pagans believed that Pan was actually born there, the, the birthplace or the origin of this god Pan, the, the god of all nature started there. And you can go there and you can see evidence of all of this temple worship and altars. And again, if you've been to Israel, no doubt I'm speaking to the choir. I understand your pastor has a great heart for Israel. It is at that very location where the, the pagans believed was like the, the doorway, the portal to the underworld. There is still to this day this, this massive cliff. And at the base of that cliff, there's a big cave, which once boiled with water, a spring that really fed the three branches that ultimately ended up being the Jordan River, the source of life in the pagan's mind. And in that cave, in that spring, they believed in that hole was the very gate of hell. Interesting, isn't it? The very portal to the underworld. And these wretched pagan people would quite literally cast their children off that cliff into the hole of that cave. And if that child disappeared and never submerged downstream, they concluded he made it to the afterworld and was blessed and accepted by the gods. But if that little precious child bobbed to the surface downstream, they concluded he was rejected by the gods and therefore family was cursed, family was disapproved of. What a horrible existence, right? Can you, can you imagine the, the emotion? Can you imagine the, the, the horror on the faces of parents? What, what a lie. It is amazing to me that this human race will embrace horrific lies and the truth walks right by their door and makes itself available and they send it down the street. Doesn't that blow your mind? It's that scene where Jesus sat his disciples down and said, all right, guys, who do men say that I am, understand, that site represented polytheism, all these gods, all the, the, the heroes, the deities of man. Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And, and the response is fascinating to me. The response really does kind of typify the way the human race looks at an individual, specifically Jesus. The first statement, you are being called by many, Lord, in the multitude, John the Baptist. The idea is like John the Baptist reincarnate, okay? Um, which is interesting because that's actually one of the doctrines of the Pharisees, that the souls or the spirits of godly men would kind of impose themselves on, you know, new bodies, kind of like reincarnation. But the Pharisees actually taught and believed that, which is interesting, okay? Some say you're John the Baptist. We don't have to wonder why. What was it about John the Baptist that correlated with the ministry of Christ? It is that confrontational, you know, no holds barred truth message of repentance, right? And, and there are people in the crowd that heard John the Baptist say to Herod, who do you think you are? 
You think you're off the hook with God? Look to the Pharisees and say, who do you think you are? The ax is laid at the root. You better bring forth fruit or you'll be cut down and cast into the fire. Nobody talked to the Jewish leadership that way. John did. John did. And boldly proclaimed, without favoritism, repentance. Well, as we studied last night, in comes Jesus. His, his public ministry begin, begins, and, and he starts his public ministry with, a, with an identical message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That same Jesus would look to Herod, who says, sends out his little minions, you know, Jesus, Herod's looking for you. You're here, and you better watch yourself. Herod's looking for you. And Jesus says, you tell that little fox, I'll be here today, tomorrow, in the next day. Look this up. Don't take my word for it. He uses the term vixen, female fox. I love that. I love that. You understand? You tell the little girl fox. And, and do you know your history? Do you understand the effeminate qualities of Herod? Do you understand the sins and the vices of his life? Jesus said, not horribly concerned about feelings, you tell that little vixen, I'll be right here today, tomorrow, and the next day. That was never presented to me as a little boy in Sunday school, ever. I never knew that Jesus was like that. I never understood even the weight of the, the, the money changers' booths, these, these hardwood tables that our Lord Jesus comes and flips over. And I pictured like a TV tray, wrong. Big <laughs> furniture, and he just unearths them, turns them over, and very confrontational. Fashioned a whip. And, and drove the Pharisees out, I wish I would have known that Jesus was when, I, when I was a kid. And I love the ladies, man. I love the ladies in the churches I grew up in. I love their hearts, so well intended. I, I wish more men were involved in children's church. We desperately need that, that, that involvement, desperately. I'm thankful for what God has done at our little fellowship. You know, men teaching, teaching children's church. Praise God for that. But the, the Jesus that I was presented with was, was a lot more like Mr. Rogers, truthfully. God bless Mr. Rogers. Um, but didn't inspire me, necessarily. So some are saying uh, John the Baptist. And then, of course, Elijah. You guys know what Elijah was all about, right? The, the signs and wonders prophet. A prophet who would call fire down from the sky. A reputation of doing the miraculous. Of course, Jesus, right? healing lepers, raising the dead, shutting storms off, multiplying food. Jesus very quickly gained for himself this reputation of a signs and wonders prophet. Could it be Elijah? Jeremiah, you know, his reputation, you know, wept. The, the weeping prophet was very concerned about suffering humanity, very concerned about the plight of his people. And, uh, you know, Jesus, of course, you know, wept over Jerusalem, wept when he was confronted with the reality of the death of Lazarus, wept when he was confronted with the effects of sin in that culture. And, uh, you know, a lot of people love to see a man cry. So glad he can be in touch with that part of him. But that's denominational Christianity, isn't it, guys? Isn't that denominational Christianity? Isn't that the tendency to this day in the church to look at an aspect of Jesus and kind of overemphasize it and act like this is what Jesus all of, is all about, all about confrontation and laying out truth, but almost to the degree that they deny the supernatural part of him, deny the miracles. Do you understand? And then there's denominations within Christianity that, that it's all about the signs and the wonder. And there's virtually no truth, no Bible teaching. It's just a show. It's just to, it's trying to frenzy up some emotion. That's the thing they see as they look to Christ. Miracles. Feelings. It's tragic. And then there is a part of Christianity, it's almost like social reform, man. They, they believe the entire gospel is just meeting the suffering needs of humanity. Let's drill a well, let's build a hospital. But there's no gospel at all. There's no call to repentance at all. We're no different. We follow Wesley. We follow Spurgeon. We, we make denominations around men that God used. We are no different than John the Baptist followers, Elijah followers, Jeremiah followers. We're no different. Shallow. <clears throat> what we need to do, brothers, what God is teaching his disciples, Peter included, brothers, is we have to submit to the Jesus that God's word reveals. You understand? To take him in his entirety. 
to receive and yield ourselves to all of the above. That's the precious thing about Peter. Peter did get that. Peter had a revelation, as we see. He understands you are the Christ. Now, to us in this Western world, that might not carry the same amount of weight. To a Jew, that meant to Peter, this declaration from Peter's mouth insinuated, you are the hero that I've heard about my entire life. Isn't that awesome? The one that was predicted in the Old Testament. The one that would come. And, and liberate us, right? Vindicate us. You're the one. You are not just a man who speaks for God. You are God who is speaking among men. You're the son of the living God. That is a declaration of deity. It's powerful. Powerful revelation. Peter got one right. That list is much shorter than what he got wrong. But here, Peter nails it, and he's commended in front of these men. Look at verse 17, or verse 16, uh, 17, excuse me. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, what does that mean for us, brothers? Maybe you're here this morning at this conference, and all you know about Jesus is just what you have gained through the knowledge of other men teaching you. All you have really when it comes to Jesus is just just some head knowledge. There's a file cabinet up there and you can draw the Jesus file and you can rehearse or recite some facts and some things about him, but you have never had your own personal supernatural revelation. I mean just him and you, where he reveals himself to you very personally as your Lord, as your Savior. I, my heart bleeds for you if you're here this morning and, and that's you. If you just have a statistical understanding or a factual understanding of Jesus. But he says to Peter, you didn't figure that on your own. It wasn't just flesh and blood that, that instructed you. That came, that revelation, that understanding, accurate understanding of who I am, all the above, deity, Christ, the Savior, the hero, that came to you, Peter, from my Father in heaven, supernatural in its origin. I pray that for you. We're moving fast to the outpouring of God's Spirit. That's the emphasis of this weekend. But let me start with this, guys. Until you're willing to come to that place where you realize, I depend on me more than I need to, right? Or at all. And until you come to the place where you have a clear, accurate picture of who Christ is, whom do you say that he is? What is there to pour out his spirit on? Do you understand? I really pray that the Lord does that to your heart this weekend, that you really have a personal understanding of Jesus and his power, how he has been fully revealed to us through the word of God. Verse 18, And I say also unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will Build my church. Man, doesn't that take a lot of pressure off us pastors? Piece of cake, right? I don't have to build a church. I don't have to go out and strive and and try to drag people. The Lord's building his church. Very grateful that I can participate in any way, shape, or form. And then he says, remember the scene, and the gates of hell, I'm convinced, pointing at that hole, that spring. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Man, we're on offense, brothers. Are you here this morning living a life of, of defeat, right? Is your understanding or your approach to Christianity just kind of hanging on and not using drugs? Or, or hanging on and not looking in that direction ever again? Are you standing on a platform of victory? This is what Jesus is saying. He's promising us, I'm winning this. Follow me. Victory is a guarantee. I love that personally. I love being on a team that I know is going all the way to the finish line, period. The gates of hell will not prevail. And then in verse 19, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Remember the very first thing we read, right? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. And now Jesus says to the same Peter who heard that, I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. We're going to see before our time is over Peter using these keys, one for the Jews, one for the Gentiles. Um, miraculous. But here we see clearly that Peter could identify who the Messiah is, but the way of the Messiah. And this is the last thing we'll look, up, look at before our break. Look at 21 with me. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now listen, he just allowed himself to be publicly acknowledged as the Messiah. And he says, listen, boys, come here, listen. Do not tell anybody about this. Do you guys understand how their hearts were thumping at that point? Do you understand how they're ribbing each other like, this is awesome. Do you understand that? They have information that the nation is crying for. And they had their suspicions as he, he miraculously moved among the multitude. As he spoke with authority and conviction, they had their suspicions. You remember even when they were going around in the very beginning, could this be the Messiah? They had their suspicions. All those were confirmed. Jesus says, yes, guys, I am the Messiah. But listen, don't say a word about this. And they're going, oh. And you know, as he walks down the road, they are looking at each other like, trying to be discreet, but they are boiling over. But then, guys, their whole world was rocked when Jesus said, now listen, we're going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to suffer. I'm going to, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to submit my life into the hands of sinners, and I am going to be killed. Everything in their mind at that point flipped upside down. Do you understand that? What's the problem here? The problem is the powerful deception of preconceived ideas. That's what's going on here. These, these men grew up thinking that the Messiah was a liberator of Rome. Understand that. And once they discovered he was the Messiah, for sure, they can taste it in their mouth, brothers. That they can taste metal, right? And they're just waiting for Jesus to dethrone Caesar and liberate the Jews and establish a kingdom. And, and they're just sure that's what they're on their way to do. And then he starts to say with a heavy heart, I'm going to Jerusalem to suffer. I am going to be killed. The power of a preconceived idea. Do you have those? Do you have some wrong, very wrong ideas about God that has kept you blind to what he wants to do in your life, how he wants to move in your life? Because of maybe things you've been through, maybe men who misrepresented God to you, to me. Did that help us develop a vision of God or an image of God which is very idolatrous, not him at all? Man, it is a powerful thing, preconceived ideas. I would strongly recommend abandoning all of that and conforming our thinking to the revealed word of God. I strongly recommend that. <clears throat> Now, Peter is feeling his Cheerios at this point. You know the story. He has just been publicly commended. Um, everybody knows now he gets revelations, right? Everybody knows that he hears and is tuned into the Father's voice. So he takes it upon himself to wrap his arm around God Almighty in the flesh and advise him. It's hysterical, isn't it? Hey, come. I don't want to embarrass you, so I want to bring you over here away from the fellas. But I, I feel like I have some advice for you. And he brings Jesus to the side. He says, you knock it off, young man. <laughs> you quit talking like that. You're the Messiah. I, I told you. You're the Messiah. You remember? Hero, conquer, rule, rod of iron. Do I need to quote scripture, Jesus? You know? Do I need to tell you of all the predictions? Do I need to remind you of Genesis 3.15? You're supposed to crush the serpent's head. And Jesus is thinking, oh, I'm going to. I'm about to. He didn't understand the way of the Messiah. He did not understand that ministry is foot washing, dead to self, service to people. He thought it was about strength and power and glory and grandeur and promotion. He was so wrong, so wrong about the motive and the heart and the method of our Lord Jesus Christ, wasn't he? And unfortunately, because of that, right on the edge, brothers, 
of miserable failure and even denial of his Lord Jesus Christ. Let me wrap up this session with just these closing statements. As Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Trying to keep Jesus from the cross. I'm sure glad Jesus didn't listen to Peter. Verse 23, And he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. That is old English for Satan. Get out of my face. I love that. I wish I knew that as a kid, that Jesus talked that way to public enemy number one. Powerful enemy too, by the way. In a 180-pound frame, Jesus said to the most powerful foe in the universe, you get out of my face. That's my hero right there. That's my hero. Get out of my face, Satan. And then he says to Peter, you are an offense unto me, for you savor. I love the old English. You savor not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You can't read the Bible without applying the Bible, guys, or your Bible study is useless and in vain. So let's do that in closing. Are you here this morning? And that was a rebuke from Jesus to you. You're here this morning and you savor. You don't want to just chew and swallow, but you want full enjoyment. You want the full taste, not of the things of God, not the eternal things, but things of this earth. You savor the things of man. God had to drive this mentality out of Peter before he was ever usable for his kingdom. What about you? Who's here that at this point you know, man, God, you're speaking to me. I know you're speaking to me. I know you're challenging me to change my philosophy in life, change my mind, surrender to you. And maybe you're here and you're just really, really wrapped up in earth and status, and things, and it's got a hold of your heart in an unhealthy, idolatrous way. And you know God's saying, my son, it's time to walk away from all that and follow me. I got better plans for you than the things of this earth, the rot of this earth. I don't have a lot of tact. I, Ken Graves is my pastor. But I am going to ask you this. I want an opportunity for you to respond. I really have been praying for weeks that God would pour out his spirit on this group. Would you just stand up and acknowledge that? It's time to walk away from this world and allow Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. Is there any man in here that would just, with, with courage, stand up and say, I want to surrender. I want whatever the Lord has. Oh, I appreciate it. Praise the Lord. Many of you. Amen. 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 Well, let's close this session by prayer for this group of men. Lord, you see these hearts, Lord, and again, you see exactly what the need is. Lord, you see exactly what they are confessing between them and you. And Lord, I pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, purge your bride, Lord. Make us something pure again. Lord, any cares of this earth, any, any thrones that are represented, thorns that are represented in a group of men that are standing, Lord, Blow them away by your holy fire. Our, that's our prayer, Lord. And, and, and would you love these men, Lord? Would you show them your great acceptance of them, your forgiveness? Lord, be the Lord of these men's lives, and may their lives never be the same. And Lord, may we be vessels of honor, something that you are willing to pour your Holy Spirit upon. Uh, thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Thank you for your great love. Uh, continue to speak to us, Lord, we pray. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.